We're back from, yeah, it's a family show. We're back from lunch. Bellies are full. People are wide awake. So there is no better time to introduce our next speaker. Uh, our next speaker is the 26th Secretary of State of New Mexico, Maggie Toulouse Oliver. She, prior to becoming Secretary of State of New Mexico, uh, was the Bernalillo County Clerk uh, in New Mexico, which is Albuquerque. She's a New Mexico native. Uh, I'm proud to call her a friend. Uh, she is one of the best local election administrators that I had ever dealt with, uh, and now one of the best secretaries of state. She's an innovator. Uh, she brought uh, vote centers and technological approaches to the voting process to her county and now to the state of New Mexico. And so without further ado, uh, the Honorable Secretary Maggie Toulouse Oliver, thank you for being here. Uh, I try. I told you I wouldn't embarrass you. He, he told me he was going to say embarrassing things, and then look at that. He was just super nice. Thank you. Got it. All right. Well, good afternoon. Buenas tardes. My name is Maggie Toulouse Oliver. I am the Secretary of State of New Mexico. Uh, me llamo Maggie Toulouse Oliver. Soy la Secretaria del Estado de Nuevo México. Uh, I'm very happy. Oh, and yet a Mr. Gorman. Uh, I'm very happy to be with you all here today. Um, interestingly, where I'm from, I'm the minority. Uh, yes, I do have some Mexican heritage, but not that much. And uh, the fact that I'm a straight woman isn't what makes me a minority either. Um, I am a minority because as an Anglo person in New Mexico, I'm part of only 38% of the state's population. So growing up in a state where being white put me in the minority was a great gift that I wish I could bestow upon every Anglo person in this country. And I think it's because I grew up in New Mexico and saw how our state embraces the diversity of its culture that my respect for our cultures and languages other than English was ingrained. You know, New Mexico was originally populated by the indigenous Native Americans who lived there well over a thousand years ago. In the mid-1500s, Spanish conquistadores, beginning with Francisco Vázquez de Coronado, began a centuries-long conquest of the land. Don Juan de Oñate and Spanish immigrants started to venture up the Camino Real de Tierra Adentro, the Royal Road of the Interior Land from Mexico City in the late 1500s established our capital of Santa Fe, the oldest capital city in the nation, and began to form the state that today we lovingly call the land of enchantment. Thousands of New Mexico families can trace their heritage back tens of generations to the original Spanish settlers of the area. 400 years later, as a border state, we continue to see new waves of Mexican and Latin American immigration to our state. First-generation Americans abound throughout New Mexico, and as a state that deeply understands our roots and our combined culture, we also have a deep respect for the language of our Spanish founders. Beyond the very real Spanish language and cultural influences that are inherent in New Mexico, our Native American culture is also woven through every aspect of the community, from our state flag, which includes the symbol of Zia Pueblo, to our famous adobe houses, to our cuisine, chili, pinto beans, and fry bread, just to name a few. Most people don't know that there are 19 different and distinct Native American Pueblo tribes with their own tribal lands, known as reservations, throughout the state, three federally recognized Apache tribes, and a huge bulk of the Navajo Nation, located within our state's borders. All told, there are nine different Native American languages spoken in New Mexico. One of the advantages of growing up in a state like New Mexico is that the diversity of culture and language as a part of that culture is pervasive. Unlike most other states in the Union, even those along the border, New Mexico acknowledges our Latino and, his, uh, our Latino and, and Hispanic heritage as foundational, not foreign. Among our territorial and initial state leaders are some of the first Latino and Hispanic elected leaders in our country, Senators Dennis Chavez and Joseph Montoya, Governor Esquivel Cabeza de Vaca, and Governor and Senator Octaviano Lara Solo, just to name a few. New Mexico acknowledges Spanish as one of the state's two official languages, 
and thanks to that, almost all election materials are required to be printed in Spanish. If you are a voter in New Mexico and speak Spanish as your primary or preferred language, you have access to voter registration forms, the Voter's Bill of Rights, any and all voting instructions, and the ballot itself each and every ballot that every voter receives in New Mexico is printed in both English and Spanish. Efforts to change this have been few and far between. And why? Well, it's a good question. Perhaps when you look at other states that maybe tend to view Spanish speakers as foreigners or outsiders, you also tend to see a tension between the quote unquote founding culture and the new culture. In these places, the founding culture is perceived to be the English speaking culture and it views Spanish speakers as additions to the state. However, in New Mexico, the Spanish-speaking culture is considered to be the founding culture, rightly or wrongly, and it doesn't apply the same oppressive attitude toward English-speaking culture as perhaps it happens in reverse elsewhere. In this way, New Mexico is more or less harmonious when it comes to providing a multitude of government services in Spanish. Beyond providing voting materials in written Spanish, a very high percentage of our polling places maintains at least one Spanish-speaking poll worker to help provide assistance to those voters who need it when they vote in person. Contracting with Spanish translators is extremely uncomplicated, and many New Mexicans are bilingual or at least proficient in one language or the other and are available to help their fellow voter when casting a ballot. So, while well, we have a lot to be proud about in New Mexico when it comes to embracing our Hispanic and Latino heritage, there is another equally important side of the coin that must be addressed, and that is the accommodation of our native peoples. As I mentioned before, New Mexico has a rich and diverse tapestry of cultures, including our native communities, but we have not treated our native American people and their language needs with the same acceptance and, dare I say, generosity with which we have treated our Hispanic and Latino citizens. Despite the existence of ancient native peoples in our lands hundreds of years before the Spanish ever arrived, New Mexico was the last state in the Union to officially recognize Native Americans as full citizens. First colonized and enslaved by the Spanish, then displaced and persecuted by the Americans, New Mexico's tribal people endured centuries of pain and suffering brought about by the ruling peoples of the area. Only one generation ago, Tribal members in New Mexico were forcibly taken from their homes and sent to government-run boarding schools so that they could be assimilated into American culture and, ta and taught to speak English as a tragic means of rejecting their tribal roots and heritage. As a result, tribal youth began to disassociate with their tribes, their culture, their religion, and their way of life. In 1948, Miguel Trujillo, a member of Isleta Pueblo, sued the Valencia County clerk after he was denied the right to vote. He won, and with that successful lawsuit, both state and county election officials were forced to allow native people to cast a ballot. However, it wasn't until 14 years later that the New Mexico Constitution was formally amended to acknowledge the equal rights of Native American citizens many of whom had fought and died for our country and had been acknowledged as war heroes, such as the Navajo Code Talkers of World War II and the Korean conflict. Once Native Americans in New Mexico were acknowledged as full citizens, the despicable practice of forced assimilation was ended, and efforts to finally extend full rights to the Native community were incomplete at best. In the 1980s, a series of federal lawsuits forced New Mexico counties to make efforts to accommodate tribal peoples with language assistance at the polls. For almost three decades, these counties were held under consent decrees to ensure their compliance with Section 203 of the Voting Rights Act. Fast forward to today. All of New Mexico's counties that fall under Section 203 are deemed to be currently compliant with the Voting Rights Act. Counties with high Spanish-speaking and Native American populations provide that much-needed access and services to these voters, and we're very proud of that. However, when we look at the data, we can see that the legacy of the mistreatment of our tribal citizens is taking a toll on today's voter participation. Despite enhanced programs that provide translation and language assistance for Native voters, regular polling places on the reservations, mobile polling units that serve more rural communities and language-specific voter education and advertisement, Native American voter participation in New Mexico is still on average 6% lower than the rest of the population. 
I don't have to tell you how critical that 6% can be to the outcome of a very important election. When I speak to our Native leaders about this issue, they tell me different versions of more or less the same story. Because the state and federal government for so long did not regard their people as citizens with equal rights, it has created a multi-generational lack of trust with our government entities. Why would a tribal me member in New Mexico, whose grandmother wasn't recognized as a full citizen, whose father fought in World War II, but who was denied the right to vote in his own home county, and who may have been dragged from their own home and forced into a government-run boarding school, want to participate? What benefit could they possibly have to gain? That is the crucial question that I and my staff in the New Mexico Secretary of State's office are asking ourselves. And we feel it's our job to come up with the best answer we can in order to begin to close the voter participation gap between New Native Americans and the rest of New Mexico's voters. Recently, I announced the formation of a Native American voting task force, which will bring members of each of New Mexico's federally recognized tribes to the table to discuss how my office can better partner with our, our tribal governments and nonprofit organizations to address this issue. Our Native American Election Information Program is convening ongoing trainings of county officials, not only to ensure their continued compliance with Section 203, but to allow them to share other best practices that have been developed in their voting rights programs. For the first time in 2017, we will host a convening of all the various Native American language interpreters and translators that work for our offices. These experts in our nine native languages in New Mexico will also share best practices with each other regarding translation and interpretation techniques to bring more consistency in the information that is provided across languages, dialects, and communities. Lastly, and most importantly, our office is increasing our efforts to establish strong and long-lasting relationships directly with tribal governments both at the individual tribal level, including governors, elders, and tribal council members, as well as with inter intergovernmental agencies and coalitions, such as the All Pueblo Council of Governors, the Navajo agencies located within New Mexico, and the Navajo Election Administration. And now I get to add the Navajo Communi uh, Human Rights Commission to my list. My hope is that these collective efforts will begin to allow our office and counties to start to rebuild the trust with our native people that has caused them to hold our collective democracy at arm's length. This is not and cannot be an overnight process. It will take years of deliberate hard work to understand the nuances of the needs and desires of our tribal people in order to begin to make right what went wrong so long ago. Working together with a variety of tribal leaders and members, voting rights stakeholders and fellow governments, I am optimistic that we can begin to make this very real change moving forward. And working collectively across state lines and across our country's various cultures and languages, we can all work to reach out, to learn from those who speak languages different from our own, no matter what language they comfortably speak, so that everyone can have the same voting experience. That should be our collective goal. Thank you.